and welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and on today's episode, it is our policy focus. This month, we're looking at the United States Dietary Guidelines. Are they a recipe for health or harm? We're going to look at the history of these instructions and the government's goal of trying to control positive health outcomes in America. The school feeding programs, prison meals, military diets, and more on the menu is the government's nutritional advice inadvertently manipulating the food market and eroding public trust. Well, joining us to break it all down is one of the co-authors of this report. Julie Gunlock joins us. Julie Gunlock directs the Independent Women's Network and IWF Center for Progress and Innovation. She is also the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday co-host of WMAL's morning drive show, O'Connor and Company. She is the author of the book, From Cupcakes to Chemicals, and she hosts the Bespoke Parenting Hour. It's always a pleasure to have you on She Thinks. Julie, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I always, um, I'm always, I listen to my bio and I go, gosh, I'm kind of (laughs) busy. You're very busy. And you're also a mom of three boys. You have a lot going on and you do so much with IWF. um, And we appreciate all you're doing. I first want to congratulate you on a victory. There was a big piece of legislation passed this past week, correct? That's right. The parents bill of rights. I am a Virginia mom. I'm even a Northern Virginia mom, um, which is uh, uh, sort of synonymous with uh, activist mom. And I certainly consider myself one. And the moms and dads, I have to say, um, in Northern Virginia and throughout Virginia, throughout the United States have worked really hard um, to have their natural right of of being a, a, a parent, of having ultimate control over what their child sees and does. Um, and having the right to have information about the curriculum in schools, about uh, their own welfare and their health um, and their mental health and their mental well-being. These are things that, you know, Beverly, I, I became a mom in 2007, and I cannot believe I'm talking this way now, that there needs to be congressional action to reestablish uh, the role of parents uh, in, in a child's life. It's astonishing, but sadly we are there. We've seen what the school boards are doing. We've seen what uh, sort of activist leftist teachers are doing with the help of the school boards um, and, and the teachers unions. Um, so yes, this had to be reestablished. Um, I have some issues with the bill, um, particularly the, the um, enforcement mechanism. Uh, it did pass in the House, unlikely to come to the floor in the Senate. So the battle is not won, but this was certainly, um, the war is not won, but this was certainly a victory on the battlefield. Definitely a huge victory on the battlefield. Congrats on that. I know a lot of parents thank you for your hard work personally. I know you care personally about this issue. They can tell just by hearing you talk. <laughs> and something that parents care about as well, they care about having rights that their child is their child and not the government. They also care about what they eat. I I think it's so interesting as we look at the United States dietary guidelines this month, this is our policy focus. It's been interesting to look at the history. What is this meant for Americans' health, including what is this meant for children and their meals in schools? I want to start by just you giving us an overview of what even started this. Why did the United States think that they should be involved in our dietary guidelines? So, most people, first of all, I want to give a shout out to our junior fellow, Patricia Pernod, who actually was the author of this policy focus. She did a great job. Um, and she, this is um, a policy focus. We wanted it to come out before the new uh, uh, dietary guidelines come out in 2015. The dietary guidelines committee is meeting right now as we speak, um, going over the past guidelines and looking if they need to be altered, l- supposedly looking at the new nutrition science um, and other um, sort of medical information that has come out uh, from when they did it in 2000 and let's see, 18, 2020, no, 2020, 20. Every, 2020. Thank yeah. you. Um, and so it's every five years that they, they uh, renew these. And it's, again, they're supposed to look at new information, new scientific information that's come out. The dietary guidelines were established to give people guidance and to give really government agencies guidance. You mentioned in the intro, the military, school lunches, prisons, all follow this. Also, nutritionists follow this. Also, when you turn your food over and it says a a serving size, um, they follow the dietary guidelines. So uh, it actually has quite an impact. The problem is, as we've seen, I'm, I'm, I'm Gen X and I certainly remember the, the pyramid. Uh, Most people my age will remember the pyramid, which put 
it's 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 if you look at it today, nobody nobody eats the way the pyramid told you to eat because it put me and put meat way up high and it put carbs and uh, carbs down low, it put fat way up high. And what when I say a triangle, it meant eat le less meat and less fat and eat carbs, um, and so. And, you know, and eat, eat lots of sugary fruits was sort of the, the one above it. So obviously nutrition guidelines have changed over the years. But if you look when the nutrition guidelines came out and then you track obesity in, in the United States, when you look at childhood obesity, that has gone straight up. As the guidelines were launched, uh, the, there was, you know, a definite increase in obesity and other things like high blood pressure and other, other um comorbidities got worse. And when you consider the fact that, for instance, the dietary guidelines are, are followed for school lunches. I mean, look, we remember Michelle Obama tried to reform the school lunch process, but she didn't really try to look at the dietary. She didn't really have an impact on the dietary guidelines. And the bottom line is lunches are awful to this day. That's why I've been a big advocate of, of packing your kids their own lunch, uh, because the government is going to get it wrong. And the, gov and the reason... <clears throat> And I know I'm giving a long answer here and we can go on to other things. But the reason is, is that the dietary guidelines give general guidance. OK, they don't look at your body mass index. They don't look at mine. They don't look at my my genetics or your genetics. They just say, you know, in general, do this. And that's fine. But that is certainly not necessarily a guide, uh, individualized guidance. Um, and the other thing is, when you look at the history of the dietary guidelines, they've gotten it just plain wrong over and over again. And there are specific examples, which I, I'm sure I don't want to just make this a big tangent. But, but there are specific examples where they've gotten it wrong and they've said, you really shouldn't eat this or that. And it's actually been bad advice. So in general, these guidelines are not a good are not a good guide for Americans and how they should eat. And I'm Gen X as well, so I'm with you on that one. I do remember the food pyramid, and I remember when we went through this huge craze saying that fat is bad. No fat, just stick to fat-free food. And we remember it, the cookies that you would buy at the grocery store that, that would well. be fat-free cookies, loaded with sugar, loaded with sodium, loaded with all these other things because we thought, well, fat is what makes us fat. Therefore, we shouldn't eat fat in our food. They've gotten it wrong. Now, I will say we learn more as science we learn more as, as science continues to discover things. Um, so that is part of it. Uh, but can you talk to us just about that, that craze? Also the idea that trans fats are better for you than regular fat that you find in butter and eggs. How bad has the government gotten it in years yeah, past? Yeah, you nailed it, uh, Beverly. And this is the thing. First of all, I just want to say one funny thing. I remember I lived with four girls in college. We had an apartment right near campus, right? And it was Friday night and we'd put a VHS tape in. Oh my God, I'm aging myself. I watched <laughs> Be the kind rewind. We'd all, we'd all have that sleeve of Snackwell cookies. Yep. Okay. Which were low fat. They actually had no fat, but you're right. They were so sweet because they packed it with sugar. And when they came out with this guidance um, in the nineties, and I think they, I think they, look, they were bad on fat for way before the nineties, but when they came out with this guidance and they were saying, you know, don't eat fat, fat is, is fat saturated, fat animal fats. You know, and then you had McDonald's switching from tallow to vegetable oil, which made the fries taste worse, worse. Um, but it also, it, it impacted the industry, the entire food industry. So what you'd have is, I also recall a lot of fat-free salad dressings, right? And so what they do is they take Italian dressing, which, you know, would be, you know, olive oil and salt and vinegar and some spices, but then they make it fat-free version and they pack it with sugar, where before it had no sugar. Uh, if you just got Italian dressing, it, it had no, no sugar in it. And then, so they would, they would pack it with sugar and they did this with a lot of foods to enhance the flavor, to increase flavor, or they'd increase salt, they would do something. But the bottom line is they weren't necessarily making it, uh, it healthy. In fact, they, in many cases, they were making it less healthy. We've seen all these mistakes and reversals for, for many years, eggs, the dietary guidelines and came guidelines came out and said, a eggs are, are problematic. They have too much saturated fat. It, it, it raises cholesterol. Fast forward 20 years, the dietary guidelines actually said cholesterol is no longer a nutrient of concern. Can you imagine after all of the, the statins and, and the worry about cholesterol and people altering their, their, uh, their lifestyles and their food habits to avoid cholesterol, and they took eggs out. Eggs are an incredibly nutritious 
um, nutrient dense food that's actually inexpensive. You had people, you had the in, in egg industry in a complete panic because, and they should, they, and, 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 and understandably so, because people had stopped eating eggs. So you had, the, you had this entire marketing plan. Do you remember, like, there was all these little jingles about eggs and the good old fashioned? I can't remember exactly, but there was this. Matt, we Patricia mentions it in in the policy focus how there was this marketing, this massive, you know, multi million dollar marketing scheme put out there by the egg industry to literally save the industry because of the power of the dietary guidelines. You have other things like the dietary guidelines constantly recommends, you know, milk in schools, only certain kind of milk, right? Well, ignoring the fact that there is significant numbers of, of minority people in this country who are lactose intolerant. It's, it's common within that minority group. And so, you know, you recommend this for all school kids, not recognizing that, you know, and it, it sounds like I'm talking about equity, but this is actually very, very important that the children with lactose intolerance not be given milk. And here's the dietary guidelines putting out this sort of blanket recommendation about every kid needs milk. Well, actually it can really harm some kids. So again, you have these examples of mistakes that and the dietary guidelines just kind of goes, oops. And I want to just say one more thing. Yeah. Nutrition science is flawed. Okay. Unlike experiments on rats, okay, where we can, we can feed the rat a bunch of stuff and then see, and then lock that rat up and we control we control everything that that rat comes in contact with from the food it eats to, you know, the time it wakes up to what it does through the day. So we can get a really clear sense of what this particular thing that we are feeding that, that rat, what, how it affects them. Okay. And, but with nutrition science, and, and when I, when I'm talking about that, I'm like experience on like medications or chemicals or things like that. And that's actually not always reliable either because humans are not rats, but you can get a, a clear sense of, of it through those experiments with nutrition science. You give people like a form and you say, write down what you ate all day. And right. You, no, not everybody tells the truth. Most Everyone's people like, lie I on those. Salad, <laughs> and then I had another salad and then I didn't have any alcohol and she's drinking a glass of wine, you know, like you want, you don't want to look like you're being bad or, or eating bad. So those, those nutrition science is inherently flawed. And, um, and as a result, we get, we get skewed results. It's, you can't lock people in a room for four years and see the effect of this or that. So um, again, the dietary guidelines just, it is, it's just never going to be a good source of, of dietary guidance. And I want to talk about the market incentives and what we may even refer to as crony capitalism in this sense. You talked about a committee that is getting together to determine what the health guidelines should be. Well, there are going to be certain people there who may have a vested interest in the in a farming category, whether it's the dairy industry, or I even saw in a recent, um, I don't know if we have the official food pyramid anymore, if it's considered official, where they put um, cereals, like sugary cereals, is something that people should have because there are grains in them. And I was thinking to myself, I wonder who at General Mills <laughs> is on this committee because <laughs> there's no way that eating Apple Jacks is healthier than eating eggs in the morning. So how many, when we look at the food pyramid or we think about what is deemed healthy, I'm assuming there are market incentives that you do have people in charge of certain industries that have the ear of somebody um, in Washington. Yeah, hundred percent. Look, th these these things are, are 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 have been influenced by outside activists for many years. And what concerns me today, and I I'm very concerned about industry having an influence on that, and 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 again that leading to ridiculous recommendations like Apple Jacks. But the um, which are you know I, I'm sure many people like Apple Jacks. No, they're not delicious, food, but it's not healthy, <laughs> and it's certainly not a health food. Although I, I kind of hate categories and things. Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. The point is, what I'm concerned about today is environmental activism. You have, uh, it is suspected that the dietary guide, and I mean, we saw this in the last round of dietary dietary gu guidance coming out, or that came out a couple of years ago, was the influence of environmentalists um, and anti meat activists um, who really want the, everyone in the world, not just Americans, to go to a plant-based diet. Um, and so you will probably see limits on, on certain meats. Um, and this is entirely wrong. Again, humans react differently to different kinds of eating. There are people in this country who, it's, it's a trend now, it's called carnivore, where they, all they eat is meat. This, this is not something I could do, but there are people who have had in, incredible health benefits 
and and their blood testing and everything they they are incredibly healthy they've chosen that they probably like most americans like me like you know, I think it's pretty common to try different, different um, diets and see what works. And these people have tried a carnivore diet. Now that is absolutely against the dietary guidelines. And a lot of that is because of the influence uh, of these um, anti-meat activists, environmentalists as well, and animal rights activists as well. I want to say also, we saw a prime example of this um, a couple years ago when this is, I cannot believe this. The dietary guidelines actually said no level of alcohol is safe. Just, just think about that. Okay. Think about you go out to a nice restaurant. It's been, you know, it's been a busy week on a Friday night. You have one glass of wine according to the, and, and you haven't, you haven't had anything to drink, or maybe you have, maybe you've had a couple of drinks on Tuesday or something like that. The idea that that would be considered unhealthy. It's interesting to me, Bev, because so many times these government agencies issue these recommendations and it's in a vacuum. It's like they don't consider that having a nice evening with a nice meal and a glass of wine, you know, and sitting around a table, that's enjoyable and that brings happiness. And you know what else is good for you? Happiness, right? And it always astonishes me in these government recommendations that they sort of ignore the idea, and this is what I talk about in my book and with alarmism, you know, I say, I give one example of a mom watching her child. There was all this alarmism many years ago about kids drinking out of a, a hose, right? Because they said, oh, the hoses are made of plastic and then your kid's going to die, if, you know, because it's chemicals. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, there is some joy in watching your kid have so much fun outside holding a hose and like spraying their friends and, and siblings. But but when when you get with that, when you start to think in that way, you're constantly nervous. So that mom, instead of having a good time watching her kids do something we all did that heretofore was normal, um, suddenly she's like, oh, my God, my child is being poisoned. And so, again, this this happens with these dietary guidelines. They issue them. They're these stark warnings, these really grim warnings, like one drink, one sip, one sip of alcohol is going to hurt you. Ultimately, that like that takes away some joy in life because there is some joy in life and imbibing now and then. Now they 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 walk that back. Now they're back to the you know one or two drinks. The problem now is that they don't recognize the difference between men and women. So a, a man is physiologically very different from women. I know today we don't we don't talk about that. I know today that's unpopular to re to recognize what a woman is and what a man is. But from a biological stand, there's there's stance there's differences. And so we should consider that those differences when recommending alcohol for men and women, but they don't. But again, at least they've walked back to the zero alcohol recommendation, but there's still so many problems with these dietary guidelines. They tend to be very strict, un very unrealistic, not accounting for what humans like to do and enjoy doing. Um, and again, uh, influenced increasingly by activists. And I want to talk about that. They enjoyment of food and bring that up in reference to something you mentioned earlier, and that was Michelle Obama's school lunch program. So when Obama was president, she introduced this program to bring more fruits and vegetables to kids' meals at lunchtime in public schools. I think that there are many people who would say on the surface, this looks like a great idea. We want kids to eat healthy, all of this. But for many of the kids, they didn't enjoy the food. So not only were they not getting the calories that they needed, they were also, there was a lot of waste. The food was being thrown away. And so you saw under the Trump administration rolling that back a little bit, and he was blasted for it. His administration was blasted for it. But the point they were making is we want kids to eat food. And for low income kids, often this is the only meal that they have or, or the only good meal that they have where they have enough calories to eat. How should we balance? I think this is the hard thing for all of us. How should we balance the fact that we do want to eat healthy? We want fruits and we want vegetables. We want kids to eat those as well. But we also just need them to eat, even if it is a hamburger at school. How do you see us balancing that? Yeah, for years and years and years, the, uh, the school lunch program has taken away, has sort of reduced, I should say, the child-parent child, child -parent relationship. And I know that sounds dramatic, and I'm not going off on some Northern Virginia rant here, but it is very, very important to understand that the most um, 
The most rigorous study on childhood obesity was done at Ohio University about a decade ago, and it stands today. And they did an incredible study of how children were eating. And they found at the end of the study, and they studied, I think it was 1,500 kids. It was very rigorous study, very well respected. And they, they found that there's only three things that um, help keep kids at a, at, a, at a healthy weight. And that is um, sitting down as a family and eating dinner at least, I think, three to four times a week putting the kids to bed at a reasonable time so they get a lot of sleep and limiting their screen time. And I remember reading articles about this, this, um, this study because the, the, the scientists that were behind the study were even like, what, that's it, that's it? They were looking for some magic bullet, right? Like maybe more government intervention. And instead it was actually kind of just being a good parent. And parents, a parent's role in their child's nutrition is the most important indicator of child health and, and keeping kids free of childhood obesity. And yet we have a government that pursues a policy and their goal is to get every child. You realize that Michelle Obama and the School Lunch Association, they want 100% of kids that go to public schools to have a school lunch. And so you have a government that's pursuing a policy that is in direct opposition to the studies that show actually a parent's involvement is important. And it's important, again, because not, school lunches, it's not just lunch anymore. That's why it drives me crazy when people say school lunch, it's school meals, because you can now get a breakfast. And what's troubling is some kids have breakfast at home, then they go to early drop off and they get a breakfast at school. Then they get a really unhealthy school lunch. Um, that again, I know your point was Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama tried to reform the school lunch program and it didn't work. It, they in fact became grosser. And part of the reason that the kids didn't like them is they did that sort of, sort of snack wells thing where they tried to replace like white rice with brown rice. They refused to um, accept regional differences. So they made it mu much more centralized. So USDA had a list of things that could be on a school lunch. And I'll, I'll never forget the example in Oregon, there were pears on this tree outside and the kids said, can we have the pears? And that school lunch administrator in that local school looked at the list and that particular kind of pear was not on the list of approved um, foods. And so it really drove me crazy uh, when people would beat up on the local school lunch person when really it was USDA and it was Michelle Obama and it was the feds that were the real problem here. You, you had lunch ladies who wanted to integrate you know, more um, local school, local flavors um, or ethnic flavors, because maybe uh, maybe there was a large group of Ethiopian kids or, or, or Hispanic kids and she wanted to integrate that and she wasn't allowed to. Um, so, you know, the school. But but ultimately, if you want your kids to be healthy and if you want to avoid school lunch, pack them a lunch. I've done the calculation. I, I focused on this so much about a decade ago. I timed myself. I did the prices. <laughs> it wasn't expensive. And my idea for the federal government's involvement is expand the food stamp program so that people get more money if they need it to feed their kids a lunch, to pack their kids a lunch. Look, fine, you don't have money to feed your kids a lunch, even though it costs like a buck. And don't patronize parents by saying it's hard to take a piece of bread, put a piece of turkey on there and put another piece of bread on there. This narrative that it's too hard for parents is pretty insulting to poor people. So look, if there is a funding issue, we can expand the, the food stamp program to accommodate parents. But ultimately, the federal government should never be taking control away from parents or detangling uh, parents from their, their and the role that a, that a parent really should have in their child's life. And I want to come back to this word guidelines. So that's what we, what, what it's called, it's called um, the guidelines that are being used, United States Dietary Guidelines. But really what you're talking about are mandates with no exceptions. So you mentioned the local um, school lunch lady, what she can provide. We want more farm to table approach to this, but that's not allowed. It's because it is this one size fits all for all children, regardless of their dietary needs, regardless of the location they live in, regardless of preferences of children. And so I think even this word guideline isn't a true descriptor of what what is actually taking place because it's the government mandating what children must eat, what people must cook for um, schools, but also, again, what people eat in prisons, what our military eats. All of this comes from a one-size-fits-all, top-down approach. Is there any way that there we can push forward with some type of changes to this so it's more of a guideline, a suggestion, than a mandate? 
Well, two things. I Nothing like running into battle uh, fueled by a veggie burger, right? Uh, <laughs> Beverly, that that sounds like a good plan. Um, uh, but these, these th- that is an example of why these things are important. They do rule what people eat. And our militaries are important. Our school kids are important. And even prisoners shouldn't be tortured with veggie burgers. I'm kidding. I, I know they're, they, they've, they've come a long way. I don't mean to beat up on veggie burgers. But um, the, the only way, look, I, I've sort of got, I, I don't mean to be negative here, but I really do think, I, and I, I do kind of find it amusing that people are all like farm to table and, oh, only the best food. And gosh, you know, I need to know the name of the cow that, where this ground beef is coming from. And then there's passionate defense of the school lunch program or, or the school feeding programs, passionate defense of, of, uh, of these these this government control over frankly what a lot of vulnerable vulnerable people in this country eat um and so i think what we need to do is really encourage people to avoid this type of thing i mean look i understand that nutritionists and and there are people who in that work in hospitals and need to know serving sizes i think there is room for some very narrow guidance on things um but too often um this is these these guidelines are used to um, intimidate and and sway food companies. Um, it's used to really harm industry, industry that somehow isn't approved, like the beef industry, like the pork industry, like the egg industry, the alcohol industry, beer and wine um, and spirits. Uh, and and that that is why it's become because it is so vulnerable to influence. Um, why it's become a problem. So I am personally in favor of narrowing it and 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 not having it not have the recommendations being so broad. I also think the federal government is always like slow to accept the accept sort of defeat in that um, there are a million resources. Does anyone actually think I go to the dietary guidelines if I want dieting advice with the internet now, with YouTube, with everything out there for consumers to to um, figure it out on their own? Why in the world do we even need this? But again, um, I think there are some applications that make sense. But I do think that um, that it, it that the influence of the dietary guidance and the use and the control it has over Americans' diets uh, needs to be uh, reconsidered. And do you think that the control is increasing because of this fact? And that is that the government is vested in our health because when you do have people on government health insurance, they care whether or not um, you are healthy because it's going to cost more to be able to to cover your medical expenses. So is part of the reason why I even saw this introduced in 1980 is the government is trying to lower their costs on health care because they do um, give so much money to people who who need help in the health industry. Well, the, it's such an interesting question, Beverly. And I wrote a chapter about this in a book that IWF um produced several years ago. And I said, like, if you want the government, you know, there's this movie a couple years ago that came out where the guy goes up to get breakfast and it says like, you're not allowed bacon today. Like you've hit your bacon allowance for the month or whatever. And it was like day two. I mean, who wouldn't hit their bacon allowance on day two? Um, so he was, so, it, you know, it was this sort of sci-fi thing, but this is exactly why, like, if you get the government so involved in this kind of stuff, that's where personal control really could be a problem. It's not there yet. Um, and I don't necessarily think, I think in the 1980s when this was introduced, um, I don't think they really saw, um, you know, how much government would get involved with healthcare. but that certainly is an issue today. And look, many of these programs, it's like, you know, they never shrink. They always grow when, uh, the, and I think this is important to say on, on, the, on the school feeding programs that was originally created during the depression to give super poor kids uh, a meal it was probably a cold meal. Um, and sort of one guaranteed meal a day. And it was for the most, you know, the literally kids that were going hungry. Um, today, anybody can get a school meal. Even the children of millionaires can get a school meal. That makes no sense. And there, uh, there's this whole argument about stigma and, uh, and all of this. But the reliance on these programs, parents' reliance on these programs is really problematic. It's enormous. It's, it's enormously expensive. And the quality of the food is not good anymore because they have to feed so many people. So if you are a wealthy p- person, what are you doing allowing your kid to get these, uh, uh, allowing your kid to benefit from a program that was designed for poor kids? The quality would be better if there were less meals made and the and the the they would be able to 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 really provide much better meals if you know, they weren't feeding millions of kids every, every day. So um, 
you know, the, the, the enormity of this program is, is part of the problem. And I, I don't mean to be rude here, but the audacity of people who can pack their kid a lunch and have no problem getting, feeding their families using government programs. I think culturally people need to rethink that and take better control over their kids. And just to take this full circle, you know, sometimes I have sympathy for teachers and administrators who have, who, who kind of think they're in charge of their kid, of all the kids and parents don't really have a role. We have signaled for years to school administrators, we're too busy even to make a brown bag lunch. Okay. What, did, what, what did we expect? We have ceded so much to schools. Schools, I wrote an, I wrote an op-ed years ago about how schools are now uh, social service centers. They're no longer educational institutions. I mean, you can get birth control at school, okay? You, and, and some other pretty scary medical, medical uh, conditions. At, at many high schools, they have clinics. Some have daycares. You have early, um, er, you know, early drop-off where your kid gets a breakfast and gets entertained. You can keep your kid at school until 6 p.m. in most public schools. They have aftercare. They have all sorts of after-school programs that are, are supposed to, you know, enhance uh, a child's, you know, learning experience. I mean, there's like knitting, there's flower arranging, there's sports programs after school. I mean, we've gotten to the point that you can drop your kid off at 6 a.m. and not pick them up till 6 p.m. And they are fed every meal in between there. So, you know, sometimes as a parent activist and as a parent who's really angry at how controlling schools have become and, and, and then and they think themselves as better parents, well, what did we deserve? What, what did we think was going to happen? So, you know, a part of this is my, my uh, you know, th th there is an urgency to sort of regain control over our children and to reestablish our authority. Part of that is, is not taking these services that the schools have offered. And certainly at the very minimum, do what you're supposed to do and pack your kid their own lunch. Free, yep, <laughs> free of government guidelines. That's the moral of the story. We're going back to brown bag lunches. Do that yes. for your kids. Um, <laughs> but also I think you bring up a good point just to, to wrap this up. And that is the alarmism that we see. Ignore it. Um, we have at our access the ability to research what is best for our children, what is best for us individually. We know our genetics better, and we know that a one-size-fits-all isn't, isn't the best thing, uh, that we need to look at this individually. So it will be interesting as we see the new U.S. Um, guidelines come out, dietary guidelines. I'm curious to see whether or not, as we look at those, we can kind of figure out who was at that table, who was at that committee based on uh, the industries that were represented there. So take it with a grain of salt, do what's best for your family. But a really interesting piece, Patricia Patnode wrote it. Um, it's called United States Dietary Guidelines, A Recipe for Health or Harm. You can go to IWF.org and look at it there. But Julie, always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Bev. Love coming on. And thank you for joining us. Before you go, Independent Women's Forum does want you to know that we rely on the generosity of supporters like you. An investment in IWF fuels our efforts to enhance freedom, opportunity, and well-being for all Americans. So please consider making a small donation to IWF by visiting iwf.org backslash donate. That's iwf.org backslash donate. Last, if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks, do leave us a rating or a review. It does help. And we'd love it if you shared this episode so your friends can know where they can find more She Thinks. From all of us here at IWF, thanks for watching.